invite you to join us tonight uh, and happy to have you for actually our first program and our first edition for uh, the Souls of Black Folk uh, broadcast. Uh, I'm student minister Rodney Muhammad helping the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And let me first say in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, we thank almighty God uh, for uh, his prophets. We thank him for his light of truth that has traveled with us throughout the ages, even in these difficult times. And we are most thankful to Allah for his intervention in our affairs in these last days in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We thank him for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, his exalted servant now, the Christ figure, um, and the Mahdi, who is the Christ figure of the Muslim world. And we thank them for a great messianic uh, figure and voice for us today and for humanity in general, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So once again, um, I wanna thank uh, my co-host, uh, our dear student minister, Michael Muhammad here in uh, uh, the great Atlantic City. Yes, sir. Us here for the souls of black folk. And, um, you know, we're very excited for the first show to break us in, uh, none other than uh, our our good brother, Brother Wakil Allah, and we're going to talk more about that. But first, we want to let you know that if you go to NOI.org, NOI.org, you'll find a mountain hill of things that you can do there. Number one, you can hear our regular live Sunday broadcast, uh, which is usually conducted by our student national assistant to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, student minister Ishmael Muhammad. Uh, along with other uh, great voices from our executive council that have been feeding the nation during this COVID-19 uh, crisis and shutdown of many of our religious institutions for the past year. Uh, and we thank them for uh, the great work that they have been doing. So NOI.org on Sunday mornings uh, for Eastern Standard Time, it's 11 a.m. For Central, it's 10 a.m you can see a live broadcast coming from our flagship mosque, Mariam, right there in the city of Chicago. Uh, in addition to that, you'll find out how you can order books from uh, our Final Call newspaper and get tapes and recordings, even of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but certainly the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, and other uh, important uh, writings from some of the great authors that we have. We also want to let you know about the Final Call newspaper, a great organ for truth. You can get that paper in your cities wherever you are. Uh, but we also have digital subscriptions, in which case I'm one of those subscribers and I enjoy reading my Final Call weekly right from my own uh, laptop. So um, uh, with those things said, we can, we uh, uh, certainly want to keep you plugged in to any and all activity uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan just spoke at a, at a national event uh, where I believe uh, Black leadership is trying to unite throughout the Caribbean, throughout the United States uh, and abroad. Um, and they promised to have a, uh, the Nubian um, uh, unity uh, effort, uh, promised to have another session this year uh, in August. So uh, again, we wanna thank you for being with us. We're going to be airing on Tuesday nights uh, at 8 p.m. in the future. You can get us all the time. Uh, we'll be on Facebook Live. You'll be able to get us from our YouTube page also. Uh, and so we are, we are thankful for your presence to be with us. Tonight we have joining us a young man um, born not far from us. Uh, he grew up right there in Plainsfield, New Jersey. And at the high school level, as a young man, he joined uh, what is known as the 5% Nation. Uh, he went on to college at Morehouse uh, College there in Atlanta, Georgia. And of course, uh, there he was uh, very robust in recruiting people for the 5% Nation, even recruiting people for the Nation of Islam. He joined on with one of our own who is now uh, in the leadership position in the Executive Council, our own Dr. Wesley, and they formed an organization called the Allah Team, you know, and this is a grouping of educators, activists, uh, artists, um, cultural uh, influencers, uh, and all uh, just a very dynamic team that was traveling the country and 
doing things. Um, but the brother is also a Nation of Islam member under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Some of the books that he's authored, uh, you want to get it. It's exciting reading in the name of Allah, the history of Clarence 13X. And I believe there are two uh, releases on that book. He's also authored The Naked Truth, The History of the Nation of Islam, some fascinating interviews of early pioneers of the Nation of Islam. And he also authored uh, The Nation of Islam, Temple Number no. 7, Harlem, USA, My Years with Malcolm and Farrakhan. So we want to welcome our own brother, Wakil Allah, uh, to join us tonight. Uh, we're very excited uh, and we hope uh, that uh, uh, we didn't disturb you, but uh, we're so happy to have you tonight, Brother Wakil Allah. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings to you and peace. Brother. So, well, alaikum salam. Peace be yes. unto you, beloved brother, student minister Rodney Muhammad. Brother, you know, it's such an honor to be on your show, brother, and to be on your platform because, uh, like you said, growing up in Plainfield, we were really exposed to Islam, you know, in particular, the nation of Islam, especially during the rebuild years when I was a youth. So, coming up as a youth, and being mentored by the different brothers and sisters in the community. One of the things that we were so young that we couldn't really go out. We didn't really venture out. You know, we were 12 and 13 years old. But we had access to the Final Call newspaper, dear brother. And to mentors that we would see in that paper, starting with Brother Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, you know, Brother Jabril Muhammad, you know, Minister Abdul Allah, you know, all these different powerful brothers. And then I had there in our city, our great brother, Minister Abdul Kareem Muhammad, you know, mm -hmm. in Plainfield, who I believe was the East Coast Regional Minister That's uh, right. when I was coming up during the rebuild. But That's I specifically right. remember you, dear brother, you know, specifically. <laughs> oh, my remember goodness. You. And uh, I didn't know you personally. But I knew of you and I knew of all of the ministers in the nation of Islam as yeah. if they were like the X-Men or the Avengers or superheroes to those of us that were young brothers, grooming to be young soldiers in the community. So it really is, for me, a lifelong commitment, right? Mm. And it is a great honor to be there or here with you, dear brother, you know, especially now as a student minister for the regional over the Delaware Valley region, uh, DVR, as I understand. DVR, as they call it. That's right. Yes, sir. Praise be to Allah. They have a great, powerful history um, in dealing with the city of Philadelphia and your long tenure in that mosque. And beloved, you know, me and Brother Wesley, uh, and of course, Brother Student Minister Michael, and many of the brothers on the Allah team, Brother Understanding Allah, you know, Brother Jay Electronica. Brother Malou Sadiq, oh, yeah. we always viewed number 12 as like our home mosque, you mm -hmm. know, because you were so welcoming to us, you know, at a point in time when you really embraced us, even mm -hmm. before we became quote unquote official, you know, if you will. Um, so we were very thankful to you, brother, um, because you really threw us a lifeline to give us a platform to continue manifesting the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, where we wanted really to manifest it most within the mosque of the nation of Islam, because that is the man and woman manufacturing machine, right? Mm -hmm. How to create and how to produce gods. That's but as right. the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us, but we don't stay there, so we venture out, mm -hmm. but we definitely yeah. need a base Whenever we need to re-energize, we say, you know what? We need to go visit Philadelphia. You know, we would go visit Trenton. You know, Miles number 44, Brother Student yeah. Minister Michael was there. Oh, yeah. Um, so in that Delaware Valley is very special, you know, to us, uh, the brothers and the sisters on the Allah team. And you, dear brother, you know, are absolutely, you know, very special to myself and, you know, to my comrades mm -hmm. for certainty. So this right here is such a great honor, beloved. So thank you for having me, you know, on this platform. Brother, we thank you for coming. I appreciate those words. We, um, 
Yeah, we always loved it. I thank a lot for my secretary. He was so influential in doing that, uh, Brother Lance. And his wife yes, had experience with the 5% Nation. And, you know, um, anytime we're building something else in our community, uh, you know, there's, there's always uh, great um, support. And then there's always, you know, the controversial uh, aspect of things perhaps that people don't like. And I never forget something, you know, uh, Al Sharpton said that someone told him when he was young, he said, you know, life is like a, like a football game, you know, and you go and one half of the stadium is cheering you. The other half of the sta stadium is jeering you. <laughs> and he said, so don't let the ones that are jeering you discourage you to the point that you stop moving down the field, but don't let the ones that are cheering you intoxicate you to the point that you forget that your object on the field is to get to the goal line. So mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate, you know, the work that the Allah team was doing in that. And I guess that that sort of goes into one of the books that you did in the name of Allah, because it seems like uh, Clarence 13 sort of started the same way with a broader outreach uh, that was still uh, seemingly a I mean, in the in the wording and the mission of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, wanting Malcolm and others to really reach uh, the young people, mm -hmm. and sometimes the model that we have um, may not be designed to really get right to them the way that I, when I read the book in the name of Allah, I mean some of the methods that were used <laughs> we certainly weren't employing those methods. But uh, they were getting to, you know, getting to reach some of them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask um, uh, how you all have been faring during this this COVID nineteen period, brother Wakil Allah. Mm -hmm. um, well, beloved, you know, of course, following the instructions of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. um, definitely quarantining, staying within the home. Um, not being negligent in any of our dealings, um, only going out really when necessary, uh, cooking for ourselves, making sure, making sure we are sanitizing our environments. And whenever we go, of course, you know, we stay, we keep our mask on. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting that a lot of people may not even be really aware of how adamant the Nation of Islam is as it concerns health. And even right here in America, because when everything, when the pandemic first hit, it was right after our Savior's Day event, you know? Mm. And, um, and the interesting thing is after Savior's Day event, a lot of us felt sick in a sense. I caught the flu um, when mm. I was there in Detroit. And Brother Wesley had it worse than me. <laughs> and, mm. um, and going to the doctors and everything, getting checked out and whatnot. And uh, then to hear the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan give the lecture for that particular Savior's Day, the unraveling of America. This mm -hmm. hit right before anyone really knew a pandemic was about to go down. So it just showed the prophetic sense, just as it says in the scriptures, that the coming of God will tell you what to eat. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad manifested to us as the guide, he told us who would be the one that would guide us, meaning our brother Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, where he says to go, go, when he says stay away from, stay away from. Mm -hmm. And those of us who attempt to follow you know, that creed and follow that wisdom and guidance, you know, for the most part, we'll have a blanket of protection. And the blanket of protection that we have with us is really the power of Allah and just utilizing our scruples and our wisdom. So when he gave us that sound advice on the unraveling of a nation and also said that this could also be applicable even to those of us within the nation of Islam. So just like, a, you know, it's like a watchman. You have to be on watch at all times. You know, you take yeah. charge of the post and all temporal property in view at all times. So yeah. really following his instruction and his guidance um, as one, you know, understanding the time mm -hmm. and what must be done. Um, I think Allah, and I say all praises due to Allah, that I haven't gotten sick, you know, yeah, since sure. coming home uh, during this whole time frame. And now we're now a year in a month into the pandemic. Um, and I haven't, and I won't <laughs> take any vaccinations or anything of that sort, unless approved, you know, unless we have our own as approved yeah. within let me, let me ask you, uh, the nation of Islam. 
for the sake of the listeners, um, what exactly is the five percent nation um, and its 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 origin? Uh, yes, did it start in one city of the country or that? Right. Yes, sir. Well, the five percenters, as it was um, originally called, started in Harlem, New York, with a brother named Miss Raw, well, brother named Clarence Thirteen X, and this was in 1964. So he was a member of the Nation of Islam within the ranks from 1960 to 1964. So he soldiered under Brother Minister Malcolm X and Captain Yusuf Shah, First Officer Lieutenant Clarence Seven X. He was married to a sister named Dora, Sister Dora Three X. Mm -hmm. So this brother was in the ranks for four years. And what I like to say about him is that he wasn't what you consider a Sunday Muslim. He was like an everyday Muslim, right? So he was in the mosque. He practically enjoyed his, or really his livelihood was based on the mosque because he was um, employed by the mosque as a painter. It was called Earth Improvement Painters Corporation that was started by some brothers in mosque at Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem at the time. Um, so he stayed there throughout you know, the days and he soldiered. And he only worked, you know, in the Nation of Islam. And of course, he sold the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. And one of the things that there's a, a misconception, I think, that we even have in the Nation of Islam, because large in part, the five percenters actually get their name directly from the lessons of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. And by the lessons, we mean that uh, in 1930, from 1930 to 1934, for three and a half years, Master Fraud Muhammad, who we say is a law in person, taught the most honorable Elijah Muhammad for three and a half years in the supreme revelation of the knowledge of self. So he taught the honorable Elijah Muhammad the key to revelation and the key to all things as it was predicted that Allah would do. So as a result of him pouring himself into the honorable Elijah Muhammad for three and a half years, he instructed him in what is called the supreme wisdom, which comes the lessons, which is the unique revelation and teachings of the nation of Islam. So this developed a question and answer or a catechism. So from the 1930s on even onto the 60s, the Muslims, the FOI and the MGT all had to recite these lessons verbatim. Master Fra Muhammad, that was one of the main commandments that he left for us in the nation of Islam. And that was the thing that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad had continued. So this became a rites of passage, right? So the average FOI and the average MGT would be able to recite these lessons really just at the drop of a dime at a commandment, depending on what lesson they were on. So Brother Clara 13X was indoctrinated into that process in a four year process, right? Um, so when eventually, when he came outside of the temple or the mosque with the mission, like you said earlier, that he wanted to go out, he wanted to teach the youth and the babies as we call it, meaning the brothers and sisters, the young brothers and sisters from like eight years old up to 21. He wanted to instruct them into the knowledge of self because the youth in Harlem, New York in the 60s was very fascinated by the teachers of the nation of Islam. Because like I was telling you and me observing you through the final call and everything, that the young people saw Malcolm, they saw Captain Yusuf Shah, they saw Brother Minister Farrakhan, Brother Jeremiah Shabazz, Minister James Shabazz. So all of these local people and powerful ministers, brothers and sisters was really like mentors to those out in the community. So Brother Clarence 13X, he just went one step further. Like you said, he had some unorthodox methodologies and get into the youth. Um, but one of the things that he did was he decided to share, you know, this, uh, which some would describe as a certain aspect of culture is the reciting of the lessons of Master Farad Muhammad and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, which was a first. So he gave them the lessons and he taught them that the name of this movement was gonna be the five percenters, which comes directly from a lesson given from Master Fra Muhammad and the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the lesson says, who is the five percent of this poor part of the planet Earth? That's Master Fra Muhammad asking the question. And the answer is answered by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He say, there are the poor righteous teachers who do not believe in the teachings of the 10%, who are all wise and know who the true and living God is, who teach that the true and living God is the son of man, the supreme being, the black man of Asia, who teach freedom, justice, and equality to all the human families of the planet Earth, otherwise known as civilized people, also as Muslim and Muslim sons. So when Brother Clarence shared that with the young brothers, he said, well, you can identify as five percenters if you teach this. 
because the 5%, we have um, a natural opposition in what is called the 10% of the population. 5% is that population. Then you've got the 10%, that's the population. They know the truth, yet they hide the truth. They conceal it and they utilize the truth to exploit the masses of the people. And the number one exploitation or the number one misdirection that they have is the identity of God. Where they keep the identity of God, they preach that God is a mystery, something that you can't see, something that you cannot even attain to. So they take this knowledge, so-called knowledge, a trick knowledge, and they use it to exploit the masses. And the masses are the 85% of the people. And those are the people, they're not necessarily rooted in a particular culture, except that which the 10% have taught them about. So they're exploited, they're eating the wrong foods, got the wrong diet. And most of all, they're believing in the same kind of God that the rich slave makers of the poor are teaching them about. So they, so they the come concept. right up, yeah. And so they come right up out of, 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 of uh, the lessons that were rehearsed right, right in the mosque that Clarence 13 had come from. Right. So now the 5% is, are they still in existence in, in, in their form, the way Clarence 13 and some of the others, the Black Messiah and others that had come together, I guess, to bring? They had to build it first. I, I, I imagine, do they, do they still exist? Is there someone that sits over them now? Or uh, Right. Uh, it's definitely in existence. One of the things that attracted me to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and I'll never forget this, as a young 5%er, I would hear his ministers there in New Jersey, Philadelphia, and New York City. One of the things that they would say to us, you know, we were young, we were out on the street, we was out in the community. One of the things they would say, they would say, you know, Minister Farrakhan has said that this is a divine movement. And I was like, what? Us? Brother Farrakhan is saying that about us? He said, yes. He said, it's a divine movement because it's still here. It's still in existence. And much of that is due to the respect and honor that the five percent is paid to the lessons. Now, the way Brother Clarence did it when he came out in the community, he didn't necessarily make a bona fide organization, if you mm -hmm. will. It was somewhat loose knit. It's what we like to describe as a culture, as a way of life. So the ritual was the same ritual that they taught in FY and MGT class was the foundation of the lessons, our recitation of the lessons, just like any fraternal or sorority aspect, you know, mm -hmm. these are different challenges that you have. How do you see today's mathematics? You ask the answer, they expect that, well, you ask the question, they expect a certain answer. So when the brother started the movement, if you will, in New York City, they said it was the largest youth movement only rivaled by the Boy Scouts of America. So this is a movement prevalent in Harlem, which became Mecca, Brooklyn, which came, became Medina, Queens, which became the desert, in the Bronx, which became uh, Patmos or Pilon. And these are all jargon and language that's come from the nation of Islam that was adopted by the five percenters. So the movement was there, it was solid, especially when the nation of Islam went through what they call a transition. At that time, the five percenters was a bit older. So they was able to kind of be like almost stand-ins for the nation of Islam. When the nation of Islam fell, um, they became like, like light, right? And I hear um, Brother Minister Abdul Hafiz Muhammad, uh, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. One of the things that our dear beloved brother would say is that, you know, the way he understood it and the way it was communicated to him with the five percenters at that time during the nation of Islam transition was like, in a sense, like moonlight, you know, because everybody was dim in a sense at the time. So the brothers was like reflected as light of the sun, but in an aspect similar to the moonlight, right? Um, and when Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan resurrected the Nation of Islam in the Second Resurrection, that's when everybody started lifting up in the 80s, especially in New York City. So with the rising of the Nation of Islam, so follows the Black community, so follows, you know, the five percenters. So many five percenters added on to the Nation of Islam. You know, myself, Minister Abdul Hafiz Muhammad, brother student minister Michael Muhammad, they here with the calls with us. I mean, brother Wesley, brother Shaheed Malah, Captain True C. Allah, True Love Allah. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, just like the Honorable Minister Willis Farrakhan taught, and just like Brother Clarence 13X taught, at one point in time, there would be many five percenters that would come and offer um, a service to the nation of Islam and join on to our own, which by the way, he taught we were five percenters, but he said we were the five percenters of the nation of Islam 
because the same way we learned the lessons out in the community, in the street, even though you wasn't a registered Muslim, you were still considered a Muslim by nature, you know, because you was born Muslim. So with the advent of hip hop coming in the 80s, in the 90s, that's when Eric B and Rakim, the world- I was gonna ask you about that. So they they were tied, I mean, they were affiliated with the 5% nation or at least they kind of cross-pollinated or- Oh, yes, sir. They were bona fide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were bona fide hardcore 5%. Oh, they were bona fide. Okay, they were oh, in. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. Yes, now, they, knew, they knew the lessons. I mean- Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, Buster Rhymes, yeah. Erica Badu came into the knowledge. Everybody has been influenced by it, but mm-hmm. that just helped increase. But I mean, they were some of the early rappers because I'm, I guess I'm looking at the, you know, when it comes to black music, like they can take the blues and, trace some of the early singers back to the church or, uh, right. they can, you know, Ray Charles and Aretha was seen as kind of having the, the, the blue, a mixture of the blues and some of the gospel and that kind of thing with it. And I guess, you know, we're tracing all other black music, but, you know, I've never just seen a program where they trace rap back to anything um, that had to do with theology or anything like mm-hmm. that, but it, it seems that it did. Oh, absolutely. Now, now I have mm-hmm. to interject at this point because okay, <laughs> <laughs> Wakil, brother minister, I've been talking to Wakil for the past three years about writing this book, brother. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> writing this book about this very conversation and the influences of Islam, and particularly the Nation of Islam and the Five Percent oh, Nation absolutely. on hip hop, and uh, going all the way back to Cold Crush, Born Along, and Cold Crush, Supreme Team, and we can go get real deep into the influences mm-hmm. of that. Um, but Wakil, what was it specifically that attracted you to the knowledge of self as a young Five Percenter coming into the Five Percent? Me, particularly. When I heard the black man was God, it was automatically an attraction. But what was it to you that attracted you to the 5% as a young 13, 14 year old? Yes, sir. I think when I interviewed so many people, hundreds of people in regards to their path of Islam, really it's a common theme. We almost all have the same story, right? Growing up black in America, you see what's going on even as a young person. So growing up in Plainfield, after the riots and the rebellions and everything, and it was black power, do for self, it was the red, black, and green. Even when I was like six, seven, eight, you know, I had a genuine love for black people because I was totally surrounded and immersed by black people. And seeing the oppression and reading our history of Martin Luther King, and even going back to slavery, you know, I wanted to do something to kind of uplift our community. So I was looking for something that really exemplified true black righteousness and black power. And there was no other symbol that I saw that could equate to the nation of Islam. You know, um, I ran immediately to the library when I heard, you know, my cousin tell me that the black man was God and the five percenters, the nation of Islam. I immediately went to the library and picked up anything I could. And I was talking to this white librarian, trying to explain it to her. And she sent me, I was looking at Muhammad Ali, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I just became fascinated with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and how he had this government on his shoulders. And we cut out the different pictures. And you know, when you're young, you wanna to belong to an organization. That's why many of us, myself included, at a very young age was in what you would call gangs, right? That's right. Um, so it's a natural attraction to be yeah. militant and Islam brings out that militant propensity. So when I hear that specific information designated, and now I know by the architect and the Lord of all of the worlds, just for you and I here in the so-called Negro in the wilderness of North America, it automatically made me stand upright even as a young person. So I wanted to be a soldier and it's hard to do that on your own. So I had examples. And like I said, when I saw our brother Farrakhan, that was it for me, you know what I mean? I was like, yo, this is like Superman coming. You know what I mean? Like this this is this is the one because I saw him walking down East 2nd Street in Plainfield and it had this big poster 
And it was the Let Us Unite poster, I think. And it had him like with stars and with the blue uh, suit on. And this brother had the waves. And <laughs> I was like, oh man, you know, I want to be like that, right? So that's what attracted us to it. And it gave us a bond because we went from a gang lifestyle, you know, where we was kind of fighting one another, mm -hmm. noon chucks, knives, you know, you name it, we was bringing it. But Islam, just like hip hop did, it kind of brought us all together. So I saw all that brotherhood. And when I was a young brother, I was like stingy. I was like a stingy person because, you know, when you have something in the community, right, you try to protect it because people are trying to rob you and this and that. So you even hide things sometimes, right? <laughs> you put money in your sock, you know, you just equip coming up in the hood or the street. And, um, but the first thing that the brothers of the 5%ers taught me was freedom, justice, and equality. Like I said in the lesson, who was the 5%? And I just remember going to White Castle and we got the number six. And the brother explained to me that the number six represented equality and that he was going to share his meal with me, you know, and because I didn't have any money. And that brother became my enlightenment. He became my teacher because he demonstrated a certain aspect of brotherhood mm -hmm. that, again, that I wasn't really necessarily accustomed to. And he attributed that to the teachings, you know, Islam mm -hmm. or the lessons. So that's what really attracted me. I can't say really attracted me because brother, this day, I still got the gleam in my eye for the knowledge. <laughs> so I still feel like the same person um, every time. Did you, the knowledge know, comes. Um, did you know, because growing up in the Midwest, of course, when we came in, we, I had never really heard of the five percenters. I guess it was a East Coast thing, but by being in the nation early after the first Savior's Day in 1981, then I joined right after in, in 1982. I think I met Dr. I met Dr. Aline before the minister named him Aline. Mm -hmm. But there was a brother called, he came to Chicago with him. He, he was called True Mathematics. Yes, and sir. he was with them in Washington, D.C. So I said, what kind of name is that? You know, <laughs> True Mathematics. I said, man, we done... We done gone off the deep end or something here. We done changed the name to, but I didn't know about the five percent nation and how, how they named each other. And of course, in in number twelve, we ended up with people with uh, that was born righteous was with us, and you know Jay Electronica and uh, they were uh, brother. Um, oh God, understanding, understanding, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, understanding, yeah. What the other brother that was with us? His name escapes me now. Having a moment. But I, it, oh, Ali. It back to me. Uh, no, it was true. It was born righteous, but there was another brother with us. He used to go back and forth from number 12 to New York. That's understandable. All the time. You'll probably understand Justice, or, uh, his name will come to me. Okay, but anyway, um, you know, so we, we just didn't know about like the 5% nation, but some of the accounts in your book, some people had said that like if somebody couldn't recite the lessons, uh, they might have um, been roughed up or something physically. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the case, but you can always get extreme people. Was that something that Clarence 13 would condone or is that, did, was he that extreme? Oh, no, absolutely was, not. Uh, that's not anything that he would condone. You know, the, the one thing that he was always very mindful of, knowing that he was in constant danger, he never mm -hmm. wanted to put children in danger. So whenever he had any kind of altercations, you know, with the authorities, which at the time was dealing with counterintelligence program by J. Edgar Hoover, he always was mindful to try to keep them out of harm's way. And he's on record in stating that, you know, to the authorities. So he never, you know, he never advocated anyone hurting each other. He had the same law, like you said, you know, because he was an FOI. So mm -hmm. he brought the same laws from the temple out on the street. And yeah, Brother Minister Farrakhan, say you know one time when he was in the FOI class and how he was just jokingly you know joking with another FOI and he put his hands up the Captain Yusuf Shah said to him he said okay when you put your hands up you have to beat everybody in here everybody in that, here yeah and that was the way brother Clarence 13x was with it okay if you raise your hand up then you got to fight everybody that's here so that, that was one of the preventive ways now, now there was controversy in your book around him being shot I believe in 1964 but from what I could hear after moving to the East Coast, there seemed to be controversy around either not so much how he died, but um, the reasons are surrounding it and everything. So 
what did they ever just did anybody ever come and just clear the record on both of those things 1964 and 1969 the attacks on clans 13 yes well the first time in 1964 when he was shot you know he was shot in the basement on 127th street there in Harlem. And that pretty much was because of the environment that he was in. There was an altercation that another brother that was in the temple would have had, Brother John 37X, AKA Abu Shaheed. And he had a discrepancy with a group of brothers. And um, Brother Clarence came to try to make peace in that accord. But, you know, the brother just took out a sawed off shotgun and boom, and shot him point blank. And that was the first time, you know, that when he was shot, that's how that happened. Really, that was just a discrepancy that was out in the community, out in the street, him coming to the aid of his brother. Um, in 1969 is when he was assassinated, June 13th of 1969, in uh, Foster Projects, known as MLK Projects on 112th Street in Harlem. He was going to see his family, of course, and his family, he had Sister Dora 3X Smith, and um, he had his daughters, Christine and Deborah. Then he had his sons, Clarence and Perry. So naturally at night, he would go home after leaving the Allah Street Academy or the Universal Street Academy. So after teaching the youth in the street, in the community, then he would go home. But um, like I said, it was a dangerous time at that point. A lot of people were being assassinated. But the thing around his assassination, when he was assassinated, he was by himself. So there's no one else there to actually witness it. So he was really targeted and assassinated. This thing was calculated. And uh, so no one was there as a witness. Um, the assassin or assassins escape the scene of the crime. Uh, the only thing that we do know is that just like with the counterintelligence program, they do have the Freedom of Information Act and they acknowledge that the five percenters, just like the Nation of Islam and the Black Panthers, as we see in this modern day and time, all this things are coming out about Brother Malcolm and the setup and everything like that with the Black Panthers. So the FBI documented that they had um, agents within the ranks of the five percenters, right? Mm -hmm. So they document this and they document who they were targeting. And the people that they were targeting were like the leadership of the movement. And that would have been the brothers that was former FOI. So starting with Brother Clarence 13X, then Shaheed, who was John 37X, then a brother by the name of Old Man Justice, who was James 109X. Um, then you had a brother named Eugene, Eugene 32X. So in the FBI files, they say that these four were considered to be like the leaders in the pillars of the five percenters. So they targeted those four. Um, so when Brother Clarence was assassinated, nobody was there as a witness, but the Freedom of Information Act, they have everything like redacted around his assassination. So all you see is all these pages on the assassination of Brother Clara 13X Smith, AKA a lot of father, and it's all heavily redacted. So there's something yeah. that they know that we don't know that they have yet to tell us. But, you know, a uh, truth question the ground will soon rise again. Eventually, yeah. you know, if it's a law will, a law will reveal it all. Well, but I it's understand that the, yeah. And I understand that the press tried to see if they could foment a war between the five percenters and the, and Moss number seven, right? Open to to sort of like as you coined to kill two birds with one stone, mm -hmm. and yes, uh, but it didn't work. Uh, I think everyone right. was right. Right. for it uh, there, which was good for for the black movement. But right. um, the most important thing, if I can interview on that mm -hmm. particular point, the most important thing about that is interesting how, you know, history is best qualified to reward our research. And we see what happens in the past, present, and then we know what's going to happen in the future. The person that actually circumvented the plan by the FBI, by boss, you know, which was a component of the New York Police Department that was to infiltrate, neutralize, which means to assassinate Black leadership in the New York City area. The one brother that circumvented that under the wisdom and the guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was, you guess it, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as the minister of Moss number seven. Yep. He held a press conference and right. he dealt with that whole entire subject, right? Mm -hmm. So by him holding that press conference, being a man of peace, of righteousness, and communicating this information to the brothers and sisters in the streets of Harlem, after that, it was a null and void thing. Yeah. So I just wanted to cite how history, you know, is, is 360 
in a sense, because uh, brother's still on his post, right? So, yeah, oh, yeah. So oh, that, yeah. That's how that, in a sense, became circumvented because of the wisdom of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and his minister. You know, mm-hmm. Wakil, you, you, the, the way you describe the history of the assassination of Clarence 13X, or as we know him, the father, mm-hmm. father of Allah, especially during that time where there was no clearly identifiable structure, um, the way you defined it, I want, I'm interested in knowing your perspective on the concept of martyrdom. And mm-hmm. as, a, as a result of the father's, uh, Clarence 13X, assassination, and then what led to the kind of organization of what we lovingly call the first nine born. Mm -hmm. Um, Could you speak to that? Yes, sir. One of the things that I learned as a young five percenter when I got access to Brother Minister Abdul Kareem Muhammad's lessons, (laughs) um, I read the history of Esau, the history of Jesus, the true history of Esau, uh, the true history of Jesus as written by Allah and the person of Master Fraud Muhammad. And the one thing that stood out to me when he spoke about this great prophetic figure, Jesus, that many of us, especially as Muslims, know and love, he said that Jesus offered up his life. Jesus gave his life. So Jesus paid the highest sacrifice that anybody could ask of an individual, meaning that he gave up his life. But the thing that made it so powerful to me is that Master Fraud Muhammad said immediately after that, as any Muslim would give their life, in the cause of Islam. Mm-hmm. So you know a Muslim, because our word is bond, and we should give our life before our word shall fail. You know, my life, my death, my sacrifice is all for Allah, the Lord of all of the worlds. So the true testament, as Brother Minister Farrakhan pointed out when he was on his deathbed going through cancer, now he was tested, he was right there mm-hmm. at the throes of death. And he said that his daughter recognized that he was saying, thanking Allah, thanking Allah but allowing him to be in his universe. So he thanked Allah, even when he thought he was on his way out. So that's a true testament of a martyr, true testament of those who sacrifice. So I had great and powerful respect for Brother Clarence 13 x or Allah the Father, just like the firstborns did, because he actually gave his life. He was assassinated without a shadow of a doubt because of the impact that he was having on the youth. And J. Edgar Hoover said, the focus is on those who could ignite and organize the youth. So therefore, he was a key figure, a key, Mm -hmm. he was in the crosshairs of the FBI. So when he was assassinated, just like many brothers and sisters of, you know, the movement or the culture of our people, automatically he was considered a martyr, but he was in a line in a succession of other martyrs, right? That we know from the Black Panthers, from, I mean, going back, Denmark, BC, the Haiti, the Nat Turner, you know, uh, these are all powerful images. And then, of course, going back to our brother, Jesus. And like I said, it's past, present, and future. We know in the present that, you know, there is to be a betrayal, right? They want to establish a crucifixion. And it's really this one person that put their life on the line. And if you see 1995, the May of March, two million men showed up. Mm-hmm. not knowing what was going to transpire, not knowing what was going to go down. Again, we are a big target of the government. That was the purpose why we had the march to atone, right? To atone to Allah, to do better by our families and by our children. And the brother that guided us, you know, Brother Minister Farrakhan, I see him, you know, as a Muslim, just like in the lesson, how Esau, how Jesus was, Master Father Muhammad, how we are to be as brothers and sisters, to one another. So when you're willing to give your life, just like it says, Brother Student Minister Michael Muhammad, you know, Malik, you know, the scriptures very powerfully, brother. Your exegesis of the scriptures, <laughs> good God, <laughs> is extremely impressive. But those willing to give their lives, you know, will save their own lives. You know, those who are afraid, maybe in a sense, can end up foolishly, you know, sacrificing their life. So martyrdom is something that I think that. Uh, we don't necessarily strive to die. You know, we strive to live. That's why we say Allah is a true and living God and Allah cannot die. And one of the great concepts of martyrdom is that if you do fall within the process, you know, as far as expiring physically due to whether it's an assassin, or whether you are a martyr in the cause, um, you will live forever in that regard eternally within your people, in the spirit of your people. That's another thing that Master Muhammad pointed out that stuck with me too. 
Jesus knew, he said that if he were to give his life, that he would have, in a sense, eternal life because he would be forever remembered. So he would always be a constant example. And for him just to know that he was still inspired after the grave, he gave his life to the two soldiers, right? That assassinated him. Um, so that's how I see yeah. martyrdom. But I would think and hopefully strive to think that just as Jesus did, that any Muslim would be willing to give their life for the sake and the cause of Allah. And you know, and Minister Allah. Farrakhan just said that uh, anyone that, that dies in a plague or a pandemic mm -hmm. uh, is a martyr. And he mentioned that uh, at the death of our dear brother, uh, Abdul Hafiz uh, Muhammad. Well, with some of the time we have left, I, I want to, you know, one of the questions that's been getting me, you did this history of the nation of Islam. Yeah. How yeah. did you find these people <laughs> that go <laughs> way back to the 30s, man? I mean, you talked to some people that were there with the Savior. Well, uh, yes, sir. Well, what happened in that regard, again, uh, the Honorable Elias Muhammad, a lot of people attribute uh, that quote, the minister Malcolm X, you know, history is best qualified to reward our research and is the most attractive. Mm -hmm. But really, of course, that comes from Master Father Muhammad and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. So I can't necessarily take credit for that because throughout the annals of time and the nation of Islam, they would document this history in one of the greatest newspapers that the world has ever seen in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. So I, just like my brothers and sisters, part of the research team, uh, they do an excellent job. I do an excellent job as far as trying to go out and being passionate about the history. So a lot of times I sacrifice whatever and I'll just stay up night and day, going into the archives, retrieving this information, you know, typing out this information, uh, vetting their mm -hmm. information, going to different newspapers, traveling to different institutions, you know, colleges, et cetera, uh, museums, all to extract this information because the information is out there. It's just a matter of us uncovering it. Mm -hmm. So the majority of information that I have, as far as that book, The History of the Nation of Islam, the pioneer years, which goes from 1930 to 1950, those pioneers had passed on before I even had the thought. Okay. But, but again, you, you the archive. I mean, to read it, it sounds like you're there interviewing them. I said, how did he find these people? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a sister named Sister Seal, she lived in Des Moines, Iowa. Right. She just passed on, but she used to just tell us some fantastic things about back then sitting in the temple as a young girl mm -hmm. when Master Fahd Muhammad was teaching and uh, just the way that we were uh, back then. And then of course there's Sister Medina, mm -hmm. whose mother is Sister Bernstein. She was the secretary for Master Fahd Muhammad and became the first uh, captain of known captain of the MGT uh, in the nation, and she has a lot of material too. But I didn't know you had research. So that is incredible, brother. Uh, yeah, the way that book Mr. is put Medina. together, I, I, yeah. I'm picturing you there finding these people on the streets of Detroit. And I said, you know, I didn't even know some of these people were still around. But uh, that that helps me that you uh, to know that you secured some of those testimonies. Mm -hmm. So how did the testimonies even, <clears throat> how, did, how did they even get, I mean, somebody must, must have questioned them or something to get the testimonies the way you, mm -hmm. you got them and put them in the book. Right, in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, <laughs> one of the things I heard the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan express, um, what, has, is, what Islam has done for me, right? The different stories and how we came into Islam and the <clears throat> benefits of Islam. So they had a constant series in the Muhammad Speaks, what Islam has done for me. And it was the different pioneers writing about their experiences. So I took a lot of that directly verbatim from their experiences. And that's how I wrote it, like a documentary. One of the great things about um, learning as a young person, the history of Master Fahd Muhammad as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, gave it to us. He said that Master Fahd Muhammad can recite history 150,000 years verbatim. And he would explain it to you as if you was right there witnessing it for yourself. And when you hear like in the black community uh, and throughout the diaspora, like we have uh, griots, right? A griot, some people would say. Yeah. Um, and these are people that deal with um, actual, you know, verbal history, 
right? And the communicating the spoken word. And Brother Minister uh, Abdul Akbar Muhammad, gotta give him a shout out because mm -hmm. he was one of the first brothers that really inspired a lot of us to chronicle mm -hmm. history. Like Brother uh, brother Student Minister Carlos out of Baltimore with the NOI yeah. archives, Brother Ali out of Detroit. Like you said, uh, my sister, and I love my sister so much, the great sister Medina and her family, the family of Brother Supreme Minister John Muhammad, the brother of the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So in a way that when you're dealing with the spoken word or the history or the, uh, you know, the verbal history is being shared by those in the community, you really get the pulse and the heartbeat and the rhythm, you know what I mean? So you get the soulful aspect of it. And so you really think that you were really there because the people that were telling you um, and the energy coming out of the pages you know, you can feel the energy and spirit. Like you said, you can feel yeah. the vibe, of how they're communicating, right? And they're telling you firsthand accounts and that they were there. So I always express it uh, in the Nation of Islam. And I'm thankful for my brother, student minister, Michael Muhammad, because he's like the number one brother. Him and brother Abdul, student minister Abdul Muhammad out of Chicago. And of course, my brother, student minister, West, Dr. Wesley, um, have always been great advocates for the history and even inspiring me to say, you know, hey, you know what, brothers and sisters, you probably should check this book out if you want to learn about, you know, some of the early history. Because in our lessons, in the original instructions to the laborers, it says that we will be tested on the three and a half year history, mm -hmm. right? So um, I like to go back in time Very, yeah. and see these things from this great, powerful, I mean, this should be a movie about it. This should be a documentary in the sense that we produce, and they did produce a documentary in the Nation of Islam, I believe it was in 1975, chronicling the early years mm -hmm. of the Nation of Islam. So I really use that, utilize that as a reference. Is that in existence years. now, yeah. that documentary? That, yes, that sir. Documentary yes, sir. Is. Is now? yes, sir. It's uh, on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yes, sir. It's now. on YouTube, uh, those early years. Wow, that is mm -hmm. really something. So, so with all of that research and everything, I mean, you, you, you. Obviously, there, there's groups of you emerging that just are mm -hmm. grabbing large slices of this great history uh, mm -hmm. of our 90 years or more uh, mm -hmm. being up uh, in uh, America. Um, you know, and I, it, it does seem like it needs to get wrapped up in some kind of big documentary. You know, maybe with all of you you speaking of something on aspects of what you have brought so that this thing can be put together in a way uh, because I'm sure our enemies uh, and hosts that the Quran promised us who sit and watch us from a place that we know not, I'm sure they're putting together their own documentary for their own spin. Right. Uh, and it made me, I thought about it when I saw this recent um, event there at the Capitol building and the young brother charging the car into the Capitol Police. Mm -hmm. And it took my mind back after they went to his Facebook page to try to tie him with the Nation of Islam. And of course, the spin that they wanted was that somehow our teaching mm -hmm. uh, would be something that would lead somebody to do something like this. And obviously, it's just the opposite. Right. Uh, but um, th th in the early years, I still have some writings of some people who were they had come to the temple, but they sort of left, I think his name was Robert Harris, and he ended up doing something drastic there in the 30s in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So it made me think, well, God, if they put all that together, they could produce a horror story mm -hmm. about us out of it with their own spin. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if we had something that really put the proper light, or put these all these events in the proper light as we bring the nation of islam's history to some larger documentary they they have a they have a documentary that my wife and i had secured at one time called from montgomery to selma mm -hmm. and it covers the career of dr king the nonviolent direct action movement all the way from rosa parks uh refusing to give up that seat uh to Martin Luther King being assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, but it covers so much of the history um, that you get a you get a fuller picture. 
of right. Dr. King and those those lieutenants that work close with him. And so I'm just thinking about something like that, that just puts everything together. Um, and it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for people to plant distortions Absolutely. of the nation and especially events that have taken place. But uh, man, that is so terrific. I mean, you've been busy since Morehouse College. Uh, <laughs> did you major in research or something like that? Or I didn't even um, ask you what you majored in there. No, sir. Actually, I had majored in business. Um, oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, but my major, it's really, I guess, you really know what you really want to do when you love what you do, right? And you're willing to do it without getting paid for it. Not only not getting paid for it, but really sacrificing in the process. So, uh -huh. um, so I just always love Islam and the nation of Islam. And um, as I got inspired in high school, then when I got to Morehouse College, I kind of hit the ground running. And uh, first brother that I met, you know, uh, believe it or not, and I was getting mentored by was a brother, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So I pop yeah. up on campus and hey, I'm there running my mouth on Morehouse. I'm trying to teach everybody Islam, right? Because uh -huh. it was a lot, it was virgin territory in a sense as that went. Because I was like one of the only brothers there um, that was dealing, you know, with Islam or the five percenters, what have you you know, at that time. And uh, so from the first day that I got there, I in a sense was deputized to spread and teach Islam. And so we were blessed to raise up many there. Then others came to start going to Morehouse College and it was a whole entire group of us, me, uh, Dr. Wesley, a brother born righteous, Malusa Dikala, uh, mm -hmm. Brother Tori Muhammad out of Chicago, Brother Lieutenant Jackie Muhammad, mm -hmm. uh, Brother Bernard Kushmir, he was talking about the NOI.org and the final call, um, dot com. And I was blessed in a sense to see the vision of Brother Bernard Kushmir that he had as a young college student to actually, he introduced me to this thing called the internet. And he oh, was yeah. like, you know, brother, <laughs> he said, I'm a uh, establish the nation of Islam on the web. And I was like, what? Yeah, on the web. And this was like right prior to the Million Man March. So he, every time I would go over to his house, that he, well, he was doing on a computer, creating a website and everything like that. And he started the NOI.org and then the final call.com where these were just different brothers, you know, and sisters that was there prevalent with us on the AU Center, Morehouse, Spellman, uh, Clark, Atlanta okay. and uh, Mars Brown College. So yeah. we were very adamant and very enthusiastic about spreading the teachings of the nation of Islam. And uh, okay, I can't forget, how can I forget my great brother, Saad, the national secretary, student oh, national yeah. secretary of the nation of Islam. Right. So we were all there together, bonded, you know, as brothers. We got some great war stories we could talk about. <laughs> being, being on campus and having to deal with the administration um because we often would try to bring the honorable mr louis farrakhan up there to speak to the well school. i have to say that 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 the experience that it for me with the five percent nation because i i yeah. only know it from a distance mm -hmm. and and basically i only really know it from those who have come in the nation and been around us uh working it it it, mm -hmm. it has paid off uh, because whatever and however you were learning the mathematics and the alphabet and whatever, it, it, it landed you all with the, the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I have to say that those that are in our mosque, uh, you know, they bring something to the table, but they, they have a sense of Islam, a real passion for it. And I like that. And that Great was... Uh, that was one of the things that I saw with our, you know, our time is running out now, but man, we've got to have a part two to this show. We want to ask you to come back. You know why? Because I'm so interested in us getting into rap. You know, when rock and roll came out, there was some resistance to the prior generations uh, in that. Uh, but um, when rap came out, it was so misunderstood by generations preceding those that were rapping in that. And 
then when it took a turn and it seemed to become more toxic, you know, people tend to kind of broad uh, brush paint the narrative that rap was toxic from the beginning. And I don't believe that it was. Uh, and really having a discussion about it. And I'd like to bring on, you know, some people that with you that, you know, really know about real rap and what happened to it. Uh, but I think we need a real discussion on that because it's not going anywhere. Uh, but, you know, what do we do with it now? You know, that it's here and, and the toxic form, you know, that it's in because some, I'm a baby boomer. So we grew up on the streets south side of Chicago. We, we learned about love songs and then you had James Brown and all of this, but, um, you know, the, the, there was no song, nobody was making a song about really hurting somebody else. And I'm understanding that some of the rap now, the lyrics that are being planted in, in some of the communication in that, uh, you know, it's, it's being cited as playing a role in a lot of the carnage that's going on in the black community in that. But I so, think it begs for a good discussion to get to the root of the problem as we're always taught to try, let's try to get to the root of things. And so we know that the enemy has really corrupted us in that in that area. So brother Michael, did you have any other things? Uh, I want to ask Wakila if he had any closing remarks. Yeah, but before you uh, clo uh, say your closing remarks, Wakil, I, I do have a very important question and I'm certain everyone else would like to know. Uh, what is in the works? Can we expect another book? Uh, <laughs> oh, brother, you know, there's a lot, I would say, that's in the works. There's something constant, you know, every day, there's something constant always on my mind. And primarily, it's dealing with chronicling the history, you know, of those of us in the nation of Islam, those of us in the black community. So there's various different projects that I could really kind of go into, but for sake of not knowing which one that I'm really going to go with <laughs> at this point, but I would say it's definitely going to be something around uh, just what brother uh, minister Rodney Muhammad was just speaking on as it relates to, you know, our community and impacting some of the different people in our community that have been influenced and that are influencers. Because I will say this to what you said earlier, Brother Michael, that um, in speaking of this culture as relates to hip hop and one, um, and I've gone around different personalities and not even, I don't even wanna even talk about some of those that we know that are already rooted in the teachings and have some of the wisdom and have a fascination and enthusiasm around it. But I've been around some of these mumble rappers, or some of the people that you might be referring to that have a certain message that may not be the best of messages. But the most interesting thing, as you see the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan travel throughout the land, you see these rappers gravitate toward them. So even mm -hmm. those in the drill rap, some of the people right. that you would never think would come in respect and treasure Brother Minister Farrakhan. They're right there, and their attention, their eyes are wide open, their ears are wide open. And when those of us that go amongst them as representatives of the nation of Islam, I've never met with any resistance. I mean, only magnetic attraction mm -hmm. from some of these brothers and sisters that have these different messages. So I say a lot of that to say that I think, um, you know, big fields awake, the wide awake man and woman, you know, to work out in. So as we work, as the brother minister instructs us mm -hmm. to go out into the community, um, as we work in our different communities, I think Allah is going to bless us to attract our people and put them on the right path. Because like I said, we all got the same story. We right. all started in a sense down and dirty. As brother minister Farrakhan says, he says it's like the water coming up out of the lake or the river. The water is in a sense down there in the lake and it's mixing with the mud. But the sun that's pulling the water up, just like it says in our lesson, what make rain, hell, snow, and earthquakes, the mm -hmm. sun is pulling the water up. Now the sun pulls the water up into the atmosphere, it's purifying it, right? Yeah. So the sun and our universal flag or the national flag, the sun, moon, and stars, the sun represents freedom, right? It represents truth. It represents the light. So when we shine that light and we bring that water up, you know, which is the people, 
the people mm -hmm. start getting purified, purified, purified. Right. So what is about the wisdom? Now we got purification. So really, all I see is potential. You know, when I see what we consider 85% or the mm -hmm. law sound, I mean, all I see is that we've been instructed to see is the potential that we go and we put a law first and his wisdom and his guidance, mm -hmm. you know, a law will bless us to success. But whatever will happen, a law will be a law will will be done as long as we are Muslims lining up our will to submit to do the will of Allah. So I'm always inspired, brother mm -hmm. student minister Rodney Muhammad, like I said, by yourself, my brother student minister Michael Muhammad, uh, they're in a study group in Atlantic City. You know, mosque number 10 has a lot of powerful okay. history. Oh, yeah. Brother minister, yeah, brother minister Robert Wilmington, mm -hmm. Delaware. That that's like 35 and number 12 is like, you know, our homes, you know, like the brothers yeah. and sisters that in the nation of Islam that identify as part of the Allah team. I mean, we just love, we just love that area, the camaraderie, you know. We love um, you. Yeah, we love you too. And I, you know, we're, we're, we are out of time, but I, I want to get your promise that you'll come back so we can take a deeper dive into some of the things that we were wrapping up because you you ended it on a beautiful note yes sir that that no matter what's out there we have what we have what it takes to make it right now right yes sir uh, and um to draw on the good nature of, of of god that's already in our people um that's that's the real assignment praise the real assignment. Allah. yeah so but we thank you so much for being with us. Want to thank you, Brother Michael, and thank your lovely wife for uh, engineering all this for us here. This has been another edition um, of our uh, newly found show, The Souls of Black Folk Broadcast. And we want to have you back, Brother Wakil Allah. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you, beloved family. All right. Thanks, sir. As salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. All right.